need to find ways of talking about that so as to converge with a basic life plan with seven billion strangers. And the one difference between us is, is what we think the value of religion is in that picture. So just to, just to get a little bit, bit of the, the context here, what, you are, you're an Orthodox Jew. What does that actually commit you to with respect to belief? I mean, what, what do you believe that I don't believe that is selling into your... Okay, so... I'm an atheist, so... Well, let's see. In case, you, in case, in case you hadn't heard... Gives you a clue. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, this, this is a, I hadn't picked up on that. This is going to be so awkward interview. now. Yeah. Uh, you kids have fun. This is Ali G. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean... I believe in a creator of the universe. Uh, I believe that uh, he set certain guidelines for human behavior, that he cares what happens to us. Uh, I believe that he endowed us with, uh, in an American sense, certain inalienable rights that uh, accrue to us as virtue of being human. Mm. Um, you know, but from a Judaic perspective, which doesn't really impact public policy so much, one of the reasons that I think we can have a conversation is that when it comes to public policy discussions, uh, I try as little as possible to refer to biblical text, which means I almost never do. Um, <clears throat> mainly because what would an appeal to authority that you don't believe in mm. do? I mean, it's, it's a waste of time. Uh, so in the areas where I think we can actually have a conversation, where we're not talking about the value of kashrut or keeping Sabbath, which I think has very little, you know, relevant input for public policy and the kind of social fabric building that we're talking about doing, uh, the stuff that I think is important where we disagree is man-made in God's image, created, uh, taking the premise by, by faith that God created us with certain inalienable rights, uh, endowed us with the capacity to choose, endowed us with the capacity to reason, uh, and cares about what happens to us. Right. So... Uh, I'm not sure if you say it right anymore cynically yeah. there, but... <laughs> well, so, One so, word can do so much. <laughs> uh, un unintended, but... And yet. So... <laughs> I mean, so, so what I'm interested in is in a worldview that could be rebooted or rediscovered now. I mean, just imagine we lost all of our, you know, we had a, a, all the libraries burned, the internet went down, we lost all of our texts. How would someone rediscover this thing? Now, I can, we can make an easy case that we could rediscover science. You know, it might take some time, but if the literature of Judaism, in your case, were lost, it, it seems to me patently obvious that whatever is true about reality is still there to be discovered. And, and if, if there's some part of reality that is ethical or spiritual or divine uh, or spooky, it's there, it, it is there to be discovered by sentient creatures such as ourselves. So what would, how would you reboot religion, uh, the, the religion so, that's true? Because you, you are by accident born a Jew. Right. Right. And there's, you know, there are a billion people in India who weren't. Mm -hmm. And... I must imagine that on your account, they have, by sheer bad luck, the wrong version of this story. Well, I mean, so Judaism is actually not quite as exclusive as, as a lot of other religions with regard to this. I mean, Judaism actually says that as long as you fulfill seven basic commandments, like don't kill people, don't steal, don't eat the flesh of a living animal, uh, that, that you actually have a pathway into heaven. So Judaism is not particularly exclusive, and we actually try to discourage converts. So it's not quite the same as some of the other converting religions uh, in monotheism. But... As far as what's discoverable, I would agree with you. If, if, if the Torah were to disappear tomorrow, it would not be discoverable, which is why there is a, a necessity for revelation in the Jewish view. Right? The idea is that revelation was necessary, not that revelation was unnecessary, and that if people had not been graced with revelation, they would have come to this on their own. But, but the, the principles you just gave me, you don't think those are discoverable? Those are discoverable, as, right. So these right. Are, so the, and, and that's the reason why I say that I think that the principles that are granted through revelation mm -hmm. are not necessarily – I think that they – they caused a ground shift historically from certain ways of thought to other ways of thought. Like the advent of Judeo-Christian thought changed the way of thinking. Mm. But I think that they are also things that you can discover through contemplation, for example. So all of the things that I said about free will and reason and the presence of an unmoved mover, that's more Aristotelian than it is Judeo-Christian. Right. right? And, that, and that is stuff that was essentially discovered through philosophy, not through revelation. So that is the stuff when I talk about the necessity for reason, uh, that, that's the stuff I think that is more relevant. Now, I think that you do need a religious system in order to inform people who are not going to sit around philosophizing all day uh, what are good and bad modes of behavior. Right. And, you know, Voltaire thought the same. 
So I, I think that the, the notion of a but, tool... But is it important to believe that those good and bad modes were approved of or discouraged by an omniscient being? I mean, can't, can't we just chart a course toward greater fulfillment, greater peaceful collaboration based on just an, an intelligent analysis of what it is to be social? So I, I, I don't think you can unless you're willing to acknowledge that reason, the capacity to choose, the capacity to act in the world, that these things exist. And that has to be done based on assumption because you actually oppose some of these things, right? Like you don't think free will exists. Yeah, but, so, but I also don't think you need free will to live a moral life. Right, I've never really understood that position, so we'll have to get okay. into it. But, yeah, or whatever. Um, but, it, it, but, you know, to, to me, if, you, if you're going to have a conversation with someone and convince them, then we need to agree on the value of reason. The value of reason is not something that evolutionary biology suggests. Right? What, what, what does reason have to do with evolutionary biology, per se? It's a, mode of, it's, a, it's a mode of action that is more likely to preserve your species. It doesn't create objective truth. The notion of an objective truth that exists apart from you and it would exist whether or not you were living. This is not something that can necessarily be gathered from science alone. Right? You have to make certain assumptions about the universe and the way that your mind reflects what is present in the universe, right, as Kant would, would argue. Well, so, it's true that, that a, an evolutionary perspective on ourselves suggests that we have not evolved to know reality perfectly. I mean, we, you know, if, if you believe that we are apes that have been selected for and, and, and all of our cognitive architecture is built by virtue of its adaptive advantage in, in evolutionary terms, yes, it, it's hard to believe that we are perfectly designed to do mathematics or anything else that is... is but you do feel gathered. that you can still gather objective truth. But, so. you, but, but, but that, even that picture suggests a wider context of minds more powerful than our own that could have evolved or our, or our own future minds. I mean, there's, it's like there's no... Uh, uh, why would you appeal to minds that have not yet evolved their future minds as opposed to just a creator who put us here with certain capacities? Well, no, because, because that, we, I would argue, we don't have any evidence for. What we do have evidence for is that we're here. We, under, we understand a lot about the mechanism that is operating now that got us here and that is causing us to be the way we are. We can see our relationship to other life forms. We know that we can look at chimps that share 99% of our DNA and they obviously share a lot of the evolved precursors of our own social and cognitive architecture, but they have no idea what we're up to, right? So they're cognitively closed to most of what we're doing and most of what we care about. And by, by analogy, we know that we could be cognitively closed to what we might be capable of in a thousand years now. I mean, that, that, that our sense of what engagement with the cosmos I know, but promises. The, the, but I guess, the, I guess the argument is if you're, if you're arguing that we're cognitively close to certain things, then why are you arguing which specific things are well, no, well, well, close I'm, to? No, I'm just saying that once you, once you admit it's possible to not know what you're missing, factually, ethically, spiritually, I mean, just in, any, in any domain of inquiry, it's possible to come up against a horizon line where the known meets the unknown. You sound kind of religious here. Well, I, <laughs> you, you wouldn't be the first to say it. But... <laughs> It's, it's clearly possible not to know what you're missing, and if you, I mean, if you kill, I agree. You should come with me to synagogue. If, if you kill the, the hundred, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, if you if you kill the, the hundred smartest mathematicians on Earth right now, mm -hmm. you would Derek, you're in trouble. You would close the door <laughs> to certain conversations, maybe for two hundred years. I mean, right. You don't. You don't. But so, again, by analogy, it would be just it would be just sheer hubris to think that the seven billion of us who are currently here collectively or any one individually have pushed the human conversation to the, the limit of what's rationally apprehendable about the universe. So we know, we know there's more out there in every sense. So you, what you're imagining is that... Not every sense, right? Well, no, in, in every sense that... I mean, this, this is why from... from really, the, I'm going to have to have you over since. Yeah, 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 no, no. <laughs> but from the, from the atheist perspective or from the perspective of not being convinced of, of any religion... This is what's so limiting about this notion of revelation, because what you have, you're anchoring a worldview to a book that we know, we just know by the time of its composition and by its actual contents, can't subsume right, so you're, the, so the, the larger worldview that we're gathering every day. So you're arguing past me a little bit, right? Because the, the argument that I was making was based on an Aristotelian philosophical view of an unmoved mover and certain th certain properties that we have to have as human beings in order to create a civilization. And you're right, arguing I mean, back to Revelation, which I freely admitted that if Revelation were to be destroyed tomorrow, I could not recreate the Torah from memory. 
Right. Well, no, it's not a matter of not being able to recreate it. It's just what is its importance apart from being one among so billions of books that have inspired people to. Well, I mean, the importance, of, the, the importance of Judeo-Christian revelation in, in our particular context is it is the creator of the entire chain of events, or it is at least the progenitor, along with Greek thought, largely, of an entire chain of events and thought that lead to the establishment of the modern science that you rely upon. Uh, and well, no, but, but I mean, that's, a, that's a, again, a, that's a set of historical contingencies that are... But they're not coincidences. Uh, they're they're not contingencies. Well, no, but there was, but there was no one else. I mean, my argument here is that you could also say that virtually everything that has been accomplished in human history was accomplished by people who didn't know a damn thing about biology. Right? Like it's just, there was no one else to do the job. Every bridge that was built, that's true. every beautiful building that was built, was built by somebody who knew nothing about DNA. Right? Okay. But that's not an argument that ignorance of molecular biology is a good thing or that it should, it should be maintained. And I'm not arguing right. that ignorance of, uh, is, is, a, is a positive. What I'm arguing is that... Well, no, but I'm just, well, I, would, I would say that any kind of religious... Sectarianism is a, is, a, is a species of ignorance now that we shouldn't be I mean, that's, that's, outgrowing. That, and, that's, and that's, again, an assumption that you're making based on premises that I don't necessarily agree with. Meaning but, I mean, they, but on your account, the Hindus have to have it wrong. I mean, they're, they're worshiping an elephant-headed god and you know, <laughs> a, a monkey god. And, you know, I mean, so that, that I, mean I, I do that think, think, what's, what's I do think that, so I, I don't think everybody is right. I mean, I, I, do, I do think that the Hindus are not correct, otherwise it wouldn't be Jewish, right? I mean, like this, well, but that, that, that's what I'm fishing for. What's the significance? If you're going to go to Aristotle and you're going to go to seven precepts that anyone could discover so as to lead a well-ordered life, what is the significance of being Jewish? So the, the significance of being Jewish is that the, even the foundations of what Aristotle believed, that, he, that he's trying to arrive through, or that he's trying to arrive at logically, have to be undergirded by a faith in a God who also provides us some level of moral guidance, because even the precepts of Aristotle are too broad to actually create the civilization upon which we stand. Meaning, this is not a Greek civilization. This is a Greek-slash-Judeo-Christian civilization. It's the Athens in Jerusalem in the, in the typical phraseology. And if you just knock out the pillar of Jerusalem, then you're ignoring the impact that Jerusalem has on Athens, that Athens has on Jerusalem, historically speaking. Well, this, this is kind of reminding me of the moment when I, I debated Rick Warren once it, at Saddleback, just, just in his office. It was just the two of us and John Meacham, who was moderating. And he was, he was telling me that basically without God, you know, people would just be raping and killing and that you, you require this to, as an anchor for an ethical life. And he even said of himself, I mean, I, I don't believe this when, when anyone says this, but this is sort of the, the bluff that never gets called. He said of himself that without, if he didn't believe there was a hell, he would be raping and killing them. And yeah, and I don't, I don't agree with that. Yeah. Uh, that's actually not, a, that's actually not right. something that I, I fully agree with, but I do agree with the idea that without a... I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Fair enough. But, you know, but, <laughs> but what I do believe huh? is that a scientific materialist worldview cannot construct a moral system because is has nothing to do with ought. Science is about is and has no capacity to say anything about ought other than constructions that are based in a notion of free will that you yourself reject. I mean, I'm happy to get into all of that. If, you know, time is short, but I've written two books on, on those two. And I've read them. <laughs> but if that were true, how would you explain the moral character of my life? I'm assuming I'm not raping and killing people or, yeah, no, no, uh, or living, just, or, or living just, a very a life that you would recognize to be well, ethically that, yeah. <laughs> well structured. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, I mean, as I just, I mean, I just said moments ago, I don't think that you have to be a religious person to lead a moral life. I do think that there has to be a religious underpinning to a moral system because I don't think that you can, uh, you're using terminology that is based in certain assumptions about human nature that I'm not sure that you are recognizing that you reject. Right. If you let, let's take the scientific materialist worldview at its very base. Okay, at its very base, we are basically balls of meat wandering through the universe with a bit of self-awareness attached. We're sort of Spinoza's stones that have been thrown, and we know that we've been thrown. We don't have control over our own behavior. We don't have control over what we do. We don't have the capacity no, to react. No. Well, first of all, yeah, many people who would take an evolutionary picture of ourselves also imagine that we have free will. I've never understood that perspective, to be honest with you. I'll put the free will piece in play here because actually, actually, I think there are moral insights we can have when we see through the illusion of free will, which we, we really can't easily have without doing that. And then I, I want to bring you in here, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> very, very patient. I've fallen for that twice. 